Thank you much. So, before we go farther, Mr. Delaney, can we uh, do a quick show and tell there in terms of where we came from? Hard act to follow, huh? <laughs> that was, uh, we'll give you the URL for that. That was something I found recently and I went, wow. So now we know where we've been. And I'm saying I know where we're going. Big challenge. I've been looking at a, at a way of conveying our future and coming from the uh, ecological community, a lot of that seems to be doom and gloom, and that's no fun. Nobody's going to talk to you. So to get a pragmatic approach, uh, uh, this was a kind of a meme that was shared with me by a, a, a lady named Theo Ferguson, was that we are going to go through a constrained component in the future, and that's a reality. So if we get this conceptual model, we don't know the exact numbers, but things are changing and if we're prepared right, we can have a positive approach to looking at that future, and we can prevent uh, the constriction. Perhaps this is what we want to look for. But the confluence of some major issues, such as population, energy, and CO2, are right here front and center. And how we address these issues is going to dictate the magnitude of that squeeze as we pro project ourselves and manage ourselves into the future. Because fundamentally, fundamentally, it's not about quarterly profits. This is about our life support system, one that constrains or bounds uh, our physical and biological limits, as opposed to the fantasies that economists keep dreaming up of ex exponential increase in growth. Sorry to those economists in the group. So I'd like to. Uh, uh, share with you this morning <clears throat> some perspectives on this reality in terms of the Earth's report card, perhaps some of our attitudes, and some trajectories. I want to uh, talk to you. Okay, let's make sure I get this. Did I do it right? Yes. Uh, I'm not tall enough for this. Um, project uh, for you uh, some of the positive aspects, citizen science. We heard it from uh, uh, Professor Richard this morning. Uh, that is a very exciting area, open area for us to be bringing into the digital earth community and address. I want to talk about, again, the uh, positive aspects and the promise of digital earth technology. And of course, that is what the theme of this whole conference, and you've got much deep detail on that. But one thing to remind ourselves, so in a positive vein, that if you look around the room, there's nothing here that didn't come from the ecological goods and services around us. Not one thing. The technology didn't. 
the chairs, you know, everything came from the uh, ecological good and service around us, the water, the air. So we are dependent upon this system, and we, we must and we should continually reflect on that as a driving force for our motivation in the future. The perspectives on our reality is there's, there's three big growing challenges facing us. And the, one of the aspects of this is that they're all dealing with an exponential increase, if you will. Population growth, uh, there's a lot of issues there in terms of the consumption of resources. You can look at it in a negative light or you can realize that when there was only one and a half billion people on the planet, a man named Albert Einstein showed up on the scene. So with 7 billion people on the planet, what are the chances of a few more Einsteins coming on the scene and it's our ability to promote that? Because Einstein didn't have access to MIT and Stanford's education system over the web for free. So we have a lot of ways of promoting that. The energy issue is that peak oil is here, that it's not going to expand forever, and indeed cheap oil is, is a thing of the past. Carbon dioxide, thanks to uh, Mr. Keeling, Dr. Keeling began measuring it in 1957, and now we know that we're at a level that we haven't had for millions of years, and it's due to the carbon uh, that's gone into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels. So we talk about those realities. So, <clears throat> sometimes we think about this as, oh, we'll just solve it with technology. Everything's going to be solved by technology. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim Kunstler, who helped us launch the first summit in Auckland uh, back in uh, 06, was there and helpfully reminding us some of the realities and to walk away from wishful thinking or magic per se, we have some hard choices. They don't have to be negative, but some hard choices to work ahead in the future. I recommend this book if you want to look at some of this because the idea that technology equals food or technology equals energy is not really true. One of the things that concerns me is sometimes the constraints and things that we're dealing with are appalling. I don't know if all of you are aware of this, but the United Nations has uh, complained about the U.S. priorities, that we're going to take grain food that could be used to feed children, but we have more, uh, better ideas for what to do with that. And, the, and so there are people in the U.S. that think, well, the audacity of the United Nations telling us what to do. I'm embarrassed as a U.S. citizen to say that this is even uh, something that we consider a rule of law at the moment. Now, some perspectives on our reality, the report card, attitudes, and trajectories. And these are something, some things that I was deeply involved with in my time with the United Nations. The Global Environmental Outlook is a series of reports, and they are the Earth's report cards and the conditions. The recent report card that came out of Rio was an eye-opener. The third one that I delivered in World Summit and Sustainability 10 years ago was an eye-opener. And as you see, out of the 90 areas that they looked at for international agreement, only four showed any progress. So that's a 2.25%, which if, for those of you who are professors and teachers, I'm not sure how you grade a 2.25%. But as a colleague of mine reminded me, he said, hey, at least it's not zero. So we've got to move on, and there's some serious report cards out there. It's no fun to look at that all the time. There's a lot of things that aren't convenient to look at, and there's a bunch of skeptics and deniers out there that are capturing the attention of the media because they're a lot more fun than scientists. We scientists talk about epsilon and priorities and, and, our, and our consensus development. These other people are a lot more fun. They make the evening news, and they're paid lobbyists. And the paid politicians uh, that are being influenced by this are thwarting the UN and the international goodwill to make things happen. The goodwill and sensibilities of how to step forward are being thwarted by a few. And that needs to be addressed. Because it doesn't matter to me what the motivation is. The cost is too high. The sixth mass species extinction? How are we going to explain that later? The global warming, how are we going to explain that? So when they look at us millennia from now, they're going to see the climate change and the species, and they're going to think that it was correlated. It's correlated by one causal agent, and Voldemort is us. Remember that. It's in our DNA. But again, I'd rather think of Harry Potter and his team and the group of young ones 
and look at youth, and I get recharged every time and had the great privilege of speaking to a couple hundred uh, young boys and girls up in Auckland, and they're excited. They get it. You can tell them facts about the earth squeeze. They don't walk around crying. They can handle some information there. I love the one young girl that asked me what I saw for the future, and I said, I hope 30 more years personally. But there's things like that that they get it, and they're, they're wonderful to talk to. Now, some of our attitudes, if looked at from an outside objective view of what's going on there, are, are a bit eye-opening. We find that most people, the majority, don't understand science. And the idea that we might have evolved from primates is something that's alien to them. So if we recognize that most people don't understand science, basic science, then we're going to have to adjust the, the signal on our communication channels. That seems to be obvious to me. One of the things about concern from the environment shocked me recently. Some surveys that have been done uh, is that uh, it's dropping from the active uh, baby boomers of the 60s when we cared about the planet, it seems to be less on people's agendas. The number one fear for children in the UK and the United States from surveys done a few years ago was global warming. And again, why would we want to scare our youth? So we need to communicate to them and we need to upgrade our ability to communicate to them. I must say that it is a little disconcerting that it is no longer convenient to discuss climate change. This is a U.S. poll, and you can see it dropping, but I suspect part of it has to do with the, uh, the recent uh, mudslinging party that they're having in the United States, so who knows. So who will be thinking about our planet? Who is concerned about our systems? I hope that it is us. We have, uh, for over half a century, some real intellectual gifts to understanding. We have prophets that have helped us understand that. Buckminster Fuller and many others that laid out with incredible accuracy what was going on. So we have been hearing this, and we've had those folks out there. Unfortunately, <clears throat> the, the playing field is not level. And when we look at a 50-50 split of the wealth, it seems to work out pretty well for some people. And so we find out that, hmm, 2% have got half of it. So I upgraded, I upgraded our model and said, okay, let's see what the uh, you know, uh, vocalization of the 99 or 98% uh, who want to share the marbles. How do we share those marbles properly? Perhaps the people holding the gold have a plan for us. This is a worthy plan to watch. But it ends up being business as usual, which I always love. Bah, humbug. And the tragedy of, of the commons uh, is, is an interesting one. Because while we're losing 40% of our waste, it's about $200 billion wasted in food in the trash cans. Some of it seems to be captured by our more corpulent colleagues. And... Uh, I get scared every time I fly back to the United States that an American will sit next to me on the airplane. I promise you. <laughs> Our economic policies that, that make this all happen, the trickle-down theory is a wonderful concept depending upon where you are in this trickle-down concept. And so we find out that uh, it's been a good ride for a long time, fast living, uh, High, high Times and Ridgemont High. Anyway, it's one of those things that we do need to consider. And so I have a small message for our world leaders. It's succinct. I hope others will share with the concept that there's a lot of things on their plate, but fundamentally, it's not sustainable, and we're not going to watch you drive us off a cliff. Thank you. And by the way, we love those 7 billion people on this planet. We cherish them, and so we do care. But it can't just be Tim Forsman's voice. It has to be the voice of a lot of people. And there I find some exciting options. And we've talked about this throughout the conference. I was very excited. And I was very excited to hear the youthful voices uh, at the end of yesterday's session and go, yes, this is, recharges me because they get it. And they know the numbers game, that if we begin working together, 
We can make a tremendous change, and we don't need just a few pointy-headed ivory tower scientists telling you what's going on. The citizens are absolutely capable of bringing this data in and delivering it directly without anybody interfering into a global intelligence. And we've talked about it, and there was a very nice structure this morning, the kickoff, with Dr. Richard talking about that pipeline and citizens and influence. This is the very positive aspect of what I like to focus on. So, and, and if, you, if you catch that, uh, that URL, they've got songs now. So we have music, we have citizens out there saying, we're not going to complain, we're going to build. And just like the ashes of Christ Church, we've got people that figured it out and say, we're not going to focus on the doom and gloom. We know we can build this together. We can get the information and the data, the knowledge to make intelligent decisions. And so the leaders who are making the decisions are going to have us watching them. And we're going to say, uh-uh-uh, don't go that way. You have to go the right way. And that takes in collective intelligence because no single person is smarter than the group. And if you're familiar with the wisdom of crowns, uh, sorry, wisdom of crowns, the wisdom of crowds, you'll know that Frank, uh, Francis, a uh, gentleman named Francis uh, Bacon down in, in 1906 at the Plymouth County Fair went out and they had a big steer there. They were going to guess the weight of the steer. And when he averaged all the guesses together, it came out 1,178 pounds. Well, it turned out that the bull weighed 1,179 pounds. No individual could guess that. So the wisdom of crowds is a magical phenomenon that we need to take advantage of. And the digital earth technology and the social networks all blending to, together can make that difference. So I'm very positive about that. And it's a whole new era because now the scientific communities is recent publication by the Frontiers of Ecology and the Environment, which is the landmark uh, publication from the Ecological Society of America, is now embracing and it's filled, special uh, document, filled with incredible knowledge about what we know about citizen science now and how to make it impact what we're doing. So our multiplying effect is now beginning to be understood, and we're capturing that amazing progress in the 21st century. So a, a, a quick plug for the International Journal of Digital Earth uh, is that it's worth reading. I, I highly recommend that you go and, and look at it because there have been a series of articles, and this latest one that's being published, again, talks about citizen-generated science so that we can begin capturing the power of that. Now, the direction that we want to go in for some of this, there's many, many different roadmaps. This was uh, done by the building uh, e EcoCity Builders, and I, I thought it might be appropriate because we're talking about uh, some of the urban scenes here, and those folks have come up with these five imperatives. It's a population right at the top, of course. Agriculture, food, and diet makes sense. Uh, the built environment, how do we make it intelligent? I'm a lead AP engineer. It's nice to know that people are beginning to think, if you're going to build it, build it right and let it last for a long time. Generosity, hmm, you'll have to think about that. The last one is the one that I keep working on. Educate, educate, educate. And I love that little quote by Richard Register. It's like, hey, why don't we leave the good stuff for the kids? So what do we include? Remember the squeeze. Where do we prioritize? What do we have in common? Digital Earth can step up to the plate, I do believe. I believe it provides us with some excellent opportunities, a world network, transparency. We can share view of our stewardship so that the decision makers are held responsible under this shared view. Our capacity to predict the modeling potential to say, if you do A, B, you're going to get C. And then suggest, it does suggest, hope. And I like to live in hope. I like to have that dialogue with the young children that I have the pleasure to talk to now and then. And it's not like we don't have some good guidance. We've heard from some pretty smart folks. And now it's our time to work with this information. And I believe we can. And the Digital Earth examples, this one uh, by Rebecca Moore doing some work uh, at uh, Google Earth. Uh, she's spoken at some of our Digital Earth events. Um, shows a lot of promise. And, and so one, one chief in the Amazon is now managing his area. 
uh, advertising so other people see it, so it's a transparent, shared stewardship and defending the trajectory to the future. And all around him is surrounded, has been development, now people can see and cherish and share the joy of this tribe trying to survive. Yushihidi is a wonderful example of the kinds of technologies we have for citizen and upwelling of data, truth from the ground that can be used in political, political actions, can be used in social actions, environmental, with the people sharing this. And of course, it's free. So internet access means there's no major barriers that we can, can think of. There is no major digital divide in, in Kenya. I live there. It's a false, uh, a, a false dichotomy that the digital divide prevents these developing nations. Jump into it. The road is paved. We can forge ahead. We could use a viral campaign, the digital earth pandemic, to get a higher percentage of our population, 7 billion of us active, would be a good idea so that we can engage them as we slip into the squeeze. I think that would be advisable. Um, I believe that we need to push that curve over. More of us need to be extremely active in this. And if we talk to just 10 people within the next week about your experience here, I would be uh, very pleased. And you've got to write down that list before the end of the day. I'm going to give each one of you a quiz. Show me the 10 people you're going to communicate to. Is that fair? Or is this just your personal time to enjoy a conference? No, I'm saying a little bit of action. Why don't you go and communicate with 10 people and explain what you got out of this in a summary and how you see us going forward. Just 10, it'll work. So the squeeze is here, it's coming, ready or not. Some kind of constriction, who knows the exact numbers. Um, but it's happening. You can look for the signs. They're all around us. Uh, stuff happens, and it happens fast. In fact, that prevents us from being able to predict very accurately since when we were at NASA headquarters originally, we did not predict that Google Earth would be that well into the mainstream in the time period. And Facebook and all these other issues, no one's been predicting those. The uh, smartphone. I mean, people give a general projection, but nobody had a handle on how fast this is expanding. So things are happening fast, but a positive, a positive focus on what we can do and celebrate the progress. That's important. Along this long and windy road, we have to celebrate the progress because that's our human nature. And we need a common wish, mantra, prayer, whatever you, it is, that uh, this hope aspect... Uh, we have a president of the United States that used it, got a lot of people standing up and voting. It's not a bad thing. I personally like to focus on the positive things that bring me around. Uh, I'm, I'm at a hotel with the Argentine uh, rugby team. They're very hopeful, those boys. <laughs> Sometimes you don't reach all the goals you want to set, but it's still a good idea. So write your list of the things that are meaningful to you. Uh, multiple generations of families. I met this family in India. I had a great time talking about what they thought about the future from someone who had seen it. Uh, the idea of meeting new people, right? Making new friendships out there on this small planet of ours. The idea of uh, just family reunions, hanging out and enjoying each other. These are good things. Watching nature, right? Or just enjoying the exhilaration of watching a peacock fly which I had never seen before. Remember, there are a lot of exuberant youth, and we want to embrace that. We want to look at those that want an education, desirous of it, and what we can do with that. Remember those Einsteins? And how many Nobel laureates are in this crowd? There are many. There are many. So it is a profound place we find ourselves at this point, as we contemplate the earth squeeze and our personal and collective roles. But we need to celebrate our collective energy and joy, in this collection of people, in terms of we are talking about really positive items, we are positive actions and realistic things for our future that will make the grandchildren and the grandchildren's grandchildren into a better world. I thank you very much for your time.